Imagine flying the most advanced American aircraft of World War II and realizing the plane itself might kill you before the enemy does. This was not sabotage. It was not enemy fire. It was engineering. California, late 1930s. American aviation was accelerating at a pace the world had never seen. Aircraft grew larger, faster and heavier with every new design cycle. Engines delivered unprecedented power. Wings stretched wider. Speeds climbed beyond what early aeronautical theory had ever predicted. To commanders and politicians, this was progress. To pilots, it was confidence. To engineers, it was danger. Airplanes were no longer failing gradually. They were breaking instantly. Pilots reported violent vibrations appearing without warning. Control surfaces shook themselves apart. Entire wings twisted and tore away from fuselages in mid-air. These were not combat losses. They occurred during test flights, routine maneuvers, and basic training. Investigations followed familiar paths. Poor materials. Manufacturing defects. Pilot error. None of them explained why sound aircraft were disintegrating under normal conditions. The military response was cautious, but urgent. Test limits were imposed. Speed envelopes were restricted. Engineers were ordered to reinforce structures, add weight, stiffen components. The aircraft became heavier, slower, and sometimes even more unstable. The failures continued. The problem had no visible cause. Traditional aeronautical engineering treated airplanes as rigid objects. Wings produced lift. Fuselages carried loads. Control surfaces obeyed pilots' input. The equations assumed structures held their shape. That assumption had worked at lower speeds. It now betrayed aviation at its most dangerous moment. What pilots were experiencing was not structural weakness. It was interaction. At high speeds, airflow stopped behaving as a passive force. It became an active participant. As wings flexed, the air pushed back. As control surfaces moved, the airflow amplified the motion instead of damping it. Small vibrations became violent oscillations. Forces fed into themselves. In seconds, stable flight turned catastrophic. This phenomenon did not exist in classical flight theory. It had no name. And without a name, it had no solution. Engineers were trapped between physics and urgency. War demanded faster aircraft. Speed exposed instability. Instability destroyed airframes. No one could explain the chain clearly enough to stop it. Each accident produced more data, more wreckage, and more unanswered questions. The situation reached a breaking point when experimental aircraft began failing before reaching combat readiness. Prototypes that had consumed millions of dollars and thousands of labor hours were lost in seconds. Pilots were killed in machines that had passed every static test on the ground. Static strength was irrelevant. The aircraft were failing while alive, not while still. Something fundamental was missing from aviation science. Inside government laboratories, a small group of engineers began questioning the basic assumptions of aircraft design. They stopped treating wings as rigid beams and started viewing them as elastic structures. They questioned whether lift, vibration and control could truly be separated. Instead of isolating forces, they examined how they fed into one another. This shift in thinking was radical. It suggested that flight was not merely about aerodynamics or structures, but about their interaction over time. Airflow could excite motion. Motion could reshape airflow. Stability was no longer static. It was dynamic. The military needed answers quickly. Aircraft production could not halt. Pilots could not wait for theory to catch up with casualties. What was required was a new framework, one capable of predicting failure before it happened, not explaining it afterward. From this pressure emerged a quiet transformation inside American aviation research. Mathematics replaced intuition. Differential equations replaced rules of thumb. Wind tunnel tests began measuring motion, not just force. The airplane was redefined not as a machine resisting air, but as a system negotiating with it. The goal was no longer just strength, it was stability.
At the centre of this effort stood an engineer working far from the headlines inside the research institutions that bridged military urgency and scientific rigour. He did not design famous aircraft, he did not lead factories or sign production contracts. His work would never appear on a flight line. What he created instead was something more powerful, a way to describe how air, structure and motion interact, a method to predict when vibration becomes destruction, a mathematical language that allowed engineers to design aircraft that could survive speeds humanity had never reached before. Without it, high-speed aviation would have stalled, jet aircraft would have remained theoretical, supersonic flight would have been impossible, modern aerospace engineering would not exist, yet during the war his name remained unknown outside technical circles. Pilots never met him, commanders never sighted him, aircraft flew safer, faster and stronger because of work they never saw. By the time the war reached its peak, the silent killer haunting American aircraft had finally been identified. It had been named, it had been quantified, and for the first time it could be controlled. The question was no longer why airplanes were breaking apart in the sky, it was how long aviation had been flying blind without realising it. By 1940 the mystery had a name, Flutter. It was not a single force but a feedback loop. Airflow bent the wing. The bending altered the airflow. The new airflow increased the bending. Within seconds, oscillation accelerated beyond control. Metal did not fail from weakness, it failed from resonance. The aircraft destroyed itself using its own motion. This realisation shattered decades of aviation assumptions. Until then, engineers separated problems into compartments. Aerodynamics belonged to airflow. Structures belonged to strength. Controls belonged to pilots. Flutter ignored these boundaries. It existed only where disciplines overlapped. No single department could solve it alone. The US military demanded a solution that did not slow production. Aircraft could not be redesigned from scratch. The war clock was unforgiving. What engineers needed was not stronger wings, but prediction. A way to know, before flight, whether a design would cross the invisible boundary into instability. That meant mathematics. Inside research laboratories, engineering shifted from drafting tables to equations. Motion was treated as a variable, not an error. Engineers modelled wings as flexible systems capable of vibration, torsion and phase shift. Air pressure was no longer steady. It fluctuated in response to movement. The challenge was capturing this interaction in a solvable form. The difficulty was extreme. The equations governing airflow were already complex. Adding structural motion multiplied that complexity. Early attempts failed. Models either ignored critical variables or produced results too abstract to apply. Engineers knew flutter existed. They still could not calculate when it would appear. Then came a breakthrough that changed aviation forever. Instead of attempting to solve airflow and structure separately, one engineer unified them under a single framework. He treated aerodynamic forces as functions of motion itself. Lift, drag and moment were no longer constants. They were responses, dependent on speed, frequency and displacement. This insight transformed Flutter from a mysterious event into a calculable condition. By expressing unsteady airflow using advanced mathematical functions, engineers could predict how a wing would react at specific speeds and shapes. The equations did not simplify flight, they made it honest. Every vibration had a consequence. Every shape carried a risk profile. For the first time, engineers could draw a clear line between safe flight and structural disaster. Wind tunnels changed accordingly. Tests no longer measured only lift and drag. They measured oscillation. Models were mounted on flexible supports. Small disturbances were introduced intentionally. Engineers watched how airflow responded in real time. Flutter was no longer feared. It was provoked. The impact was immediate. Aircraft designers began adjusting stiffness, mass distribution, and control surface placement based on predicted flutter. Speed, 
Instead of overbuilding structures and hoping for safety, they engineered balance. Aircraft became lighter, not heavier, faster, not slower. The invisible barrier that had haunted test pilots began to move upward. Every hour of analysis saved lives in the air. By the midpoint of World War II, the US military quietly integrated these methods into aircraft approval. Designs that failed flutter criteria never reached production. Pilots flew, knowing limits were no longer guesses. They were calculated margins. Yet most pilots never learned why their aircraft suddenly felt safer. They did not know that behind every successful high-speed manoeuvre stood equations written by someone who never flew. A mind that understood motion better than instinct ever could. The silent killer had been named, measured and constrained. But the work was not finished. As jets approached transonic speeds, flutter would return in new forms. Control reversal, shock-induced vibration, supersonic aeroelastic coupling. The mathematics would have to evolve again, and it would, because one fundamental lesson had been learned. Aircraft are not rigid machines moving through air. They are elastic systems negotiating with physics at speed. Understanding that truth did more than save World War II aircraft. It made modern aviation possible. In the next part, the story reaches its most important moment. How this invisible science carried aviation past the sound barrier, and why almost no one outside engineering ever learned the name of the man who made it possible. When the war ended, the problem was not gone. It had merely changed speed. Jet engines erased many of the limits that had defined propeller aircraft. Speeds climbed toward the sound barrier. Wings became thinner. Control surfaces more sensitive. The margin for error narrowed to almost nothing. What had once taken seconds to destroy an aircraft could now happen in fractions of a second. And flutter returned. But this time, aviation was ready. The mathematical framework developed during the war proved adaptable. Engineers extended it beyond propellers and into the jet age. Unsteady aerodynamics were refined to account for compressibility. Structural models evolved to include higher frequency modes. Control systems were redesigned with stability margins defined before an aircraft ever left the ground. The effect was transformative. Aircraft no longer relied on brute strength to survive speed. They relied on balance. Designers learned to distribute mass deliberately. Stiffness was tuned, not maximized. Control surfaces were shaped to prevent feedback instead of amplifying it. Flutter was no longer an unpredictable killer. It was a constraint managed like fuel or weight. This shift made the impossible routine. Supersonic flights became stable, high-altitude bombers could loiter safely, long, flexible wings no longer threatened to tear themselves apart. Every major aircraft program after World War II, Ward Inu embedded aeroelastic analysis into its core design process. Civilian airliners adopted the same standards. What began as a wartime emergency became a permanent foundation of aerospace engineering. And yet, almost no one noticed. The engineer behind this transformation did not become a public figure. His work did not produce a single iconic aircraft. Instead, it altered how every aircraft would be designed from that moment forward. He worked inside research institutions, writing equations that most pilots would never see and never need to understand. His contribution was invisible by design. By the time commercial jets began carrying millions of passengers across oceans, flutter had faded into obscurity. It survived only as a certification checklist item, a requirement quietly passed before approval. Few people realised that an entire generation of aviation disasters had been prevented not by better materials or stronger engines, but by understanding how air and structure speak to each other. Modern aerospace still speaks that language. Every fly-by-wire system, every flexible composite wing, Every high aspect ratio design relies on the same principles. Aircraft today are deliberately allowed to bend, twist and respond. Stability is no longer enforced by rigidity. It is managed through prediction and control.
The airplane has become an active participant in its own survival. That philosophy traces directly back to the wartime realization that strength alone was not enough. Only at this point does the name emerge. The engineer who changed aviation this way was Theodore von Karman. He did not stop flutter with a single invention. He replaced intuition with science. He forced aviation to acknowledge motion, interaction and time. In doing so, he shifted engineering from art to discipline. Every safe high-speed aircraft since then carries his influence, whether acknowledged or not. Von Karman understood something that history often forgets. The most dangerous flaws are not the ones you can see. They are the ones built into assumptions. World War II exposed one of those assumptions at deadly cost. Its correction made modern flight possible, and that raises the final question. If aviation once flew blind at the edge of destruction, what assumptions are we trusting today, without realising how fragile they might be?